Tonight on Real to Real, we'll see how a strong-willed Texan refuses to let tragedy and misfortune pin him down. Real to Real regular Mike Gallagher has a review of the latest Woody Allen flick, Radio Days. We'll take you to Blackwood, New Jersey to meet a priest who doesn't need to see to spread God's love. Father Joe Glass has a profile of Thomas Aiken. And we'll listen as a musically talented group lift up their voices for the Lord. Hello, I'm Jane Rudolph. And I'm Father Dave McAllen. Welcome to Real to Real. For most people is synonymous with energy, activity, and strength. What it doesn't mean is restricted movement, weakness, and hospitals. We're about to introduce you to a man who from the age of 16 would be faced with a life-changing tragedy. As a young teenager, Ray Threadgill was involved in a fatal car accident. One friend died. Ray survived, but he would be a paraplegic confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. This one-time high school athlete was faced with possibly the greatest challenge of his life, learning to do for himself, despite the temptation to have others do for him, turned out to be a major influence in Threadgill's progress. Despite a crisis of faith lasting more than 25 years, Ray returned to God, believing that the Lord gives to people only what they can handle. He vowed to handle his situation and any other burden thrown in his way. Forty-nine-year-old Raymond Threadgill drives his car to work every morning, as many of us do. But the similarities end here. As you can see, when Raymond gets out of his car, he's a paraplegic. However, this doesn't stop him from performing his duties as satellite operator at the Catholic Telecommunications Center. Raymond has been in this position for the past three years. Although he was born in Galveston, he moved to Corpus Christi shortly after birth. Raymond spent many of his early years doing what most other boys do, playing baseball, football, basketball, running track, swimming, anything athletic. But all this came to a tragic end in 1954 on Airport Road. I was riding with a bar. We were going to dance in Raven Hall. And on the way out there, he turned the car over, and the boy in the middle was killed. And I was riding on the outside, and the car landed on top of me, broke my back, and the boy driving broke his leg, that's all. And I woke up in the hospital, and like, uh, either I had to make it or I didn't, you know, I could have just laid there and just died, I guess. One youth was killed and Raymond Threadgill suffered a broken back at 16 years of age. He was a junior in high school with a promising future as a professional baseball player. But now he faced the battle of his life. Right after the accident, I was in Spahn Hospital and I saw the doctors. And they didn't give me hope at all because see, I have brain damage I've got a broken back, I'm paralyzed, okay? And the doctors just said, that boy's gonna die. He can't live, there's no way. And I told my mother, I said, don't worry about it, and I said, I'm gonna live. My daddy, just to show you that they thought I was gonna die, they bought my funeral, they bought my casket, they bought a plot over the cemetery, everything. They had it all planned out. And I says, I'm not gonna die. And today, they're both gone, and I'm still here. Although Raymond was more than grateful to God for a second chance, he still faced extreme hardship. The strapping six-foot-one-inch growing youngster was now down to a mere 85 pounds and fighting to live. After 12 surgeries and stays in several area hospitals for a year, Raymond was ready to take on the road to rehabilitation. It was unbelievable. I thought football practice was hard. I learned to walk all over again. I learned 
how, all the, how to take care of yourself, how to do for yourself. In other words, always anticipate. Never take for granted something. Because in other words, I don't have a luxury of doing that. Raymond battled back all the way to join his class of 55 and graduate on time. When asked how he did it, Raymond tied the success of his comeback to a strong will. God is not going to do it, I don't think. In other words, you, he's given you a mind and a will to do for yourself. And if you don't use it and do for yourself, I don't see how he, he's, he's not going to help you. In other words, he gives you a, a burden and he wants to see how you handle it. If you can handle it, if you can't do it, well, it's, it's not his fault. Raymond said having a good family and religion helped a lot. Although he said there were some difficult moments in his relationship with his parents. He cites one example after the accident when he went fishing with his father. One of the wheels came off his chair. So I was going down the dock, I had my fishing rod and everything, and I was going down the hill up on the fishing pier. And on the way down, I saw this wheel go right by. I went, oh my God. And the water kept getting closer and closer. What could I do? I couldn't do nothing. I just ran all the into the water, you know? Rod and tackle box and everything. And I was going, help, help. My daddy up there was laughing. And he says, you want help, help yourself. He knew I wasn't going to drown. I could swim like a fish. And he says, I pulled myself up on the dock and I got mad. And I want to come here and help me get my wheelchair out. And he says, you want it? Go get it. And I said, you dirty old man. I dove in and got it. And in other words, I went and got my chair and I threw it back up on the dock and I crawled back up on the dock and I said, what about my rod and my tackle box and everything? You want it? Go get it. I went, what? In other words, I learned to do for myself. Sure, he could have helped me, but what would I learn? Nothing. In learning how to do for himself, Raymond crystallized certain characteristics within, and they remain with him today as he mows his own lawn and takes care of his house to the best of his ability. After high school, Raymond worked at various jobs. He did drawings and blueprints for a local construction company, rewired motors at an electrical company, laid pipelines for an oil and gas company, and won awards from the government while working at the Aradmac Army facility. But Raymond had to quit this job when his parents got ill. He took care of them until they passed away. Then he began a new career at the Catholic Telecommunications Center. Raymond says we're all brothers and sisters and we have to love each other. He says you can help the world situation by treating others the way you treat yourself. Raymond also makes rosaries in his spare time. He has a little altar set up in his house to, as he puts it, remind him of where he comes from. But it wasn't always this way for Raymond. At one point in his life, he was gone from the church for 26 years. He tried marriage, but it ended a year and a half later in divorce. Nagging at him throughout those 26 years was the fact that he would never have the chance to play professional baseball. Today, Raymond still gets out and throws a pretty mean curveball. See that? Rush back 15. Sports meant a lot to Raymond before his accident, but what about now? Sports to me now, uh, it's very gratifying to see boys to try and try and try again, because that's what I did. Although he still remains active, Raymond still has medical problems. He goes to the doctor every month to be treated for bone cancer. But this doesn't scare Raymond Threadgill. He's been there before. I don't have the word can't in my dictionary. And sure, it's in the dictionary. But in other words, unless I've attempted it, I cannot say I can't do it, because I don't know. Raymond's cancer has been arrested, at least temporarily. The dreaded disease may be in for more of a fight than it realizes. For Raymond Threadgill has looked into the eyes of death before and has come away smiling. I've been lucky. Well, more than lucky, I guess. With the help of my friends, I believe I can make it.
Wraith Redgill's determination, courage, and positive outlook on life are an inspiration for us all. Now, don't go away. We'll be back in a moment. Stage comes right out into the audience. There's not a bad seat in the house. The acting is top notch. The scenery is creative. The atmosphere is always exciting. It's really beautifully done. It's directed well. It's very flexible. It's creative. It's really great. They're very professional, extremely. There's a chemistry there that makes it enjoyable to attend the theater. Villanova's theater season returns on April 1st with a production of Sweeney Todd. Call for information. Little known during his day, artist and photographer Thomas Eakins was a Philadelphian of exceptional talent. A realist painter, his work includes portraits of American Catholic clergymen. Thomas Eakins did not receive recognition for his work until after his death in 1916. Here now is Father Joe Glass with more on the man, considered today to be one of the greatest American realist painters. Honest, truthful, uncompromising, realistic. These words describe Thomas Aikens, a Philadelphian many consider to be one of America's greatest painters. But words can only describe a painter. They do no justice to understanding the artist himself. This can only be accomplished through an appreciation of the artist's work. Aikens' earliest paintings show an artist consumed by a desire to capture reality correctly. This meant elaborate perspective drawings and the study of physics and math to understand precisely how light reflected on water. Having once considered becoming a surgeon, his painting of the eminent Philadelphia physician, Dr. Samuel Gross, shows his love of science and anatomy. Photography enabled Aikens to study form, motion, and anatomical accuracy. But while he only intended photography to be used as a tool to help him with his art, his photographs have in themselves become art. In the late 1880s, portraits became the dominant genre of Aikens' art. Of the many portraits he painted, 14 of them were of Catholic clergy. It was through his friend Samuel Murray, a Catholic and former student of his, that Aikens became involved with Catholics. On Sundays, they would bicycle out to St. Charles Seminary and often be invited to stay for dinner. Aikens found the environment of the seminary comfortable, for it offered an opportunity for intellectual exchange between himself and the clergy. This feeling is reflected in the subjects Aikens chose to paint, teachers, scholars, writers, editors, and administrators. Six of these portraits now hang in the Aikens room at St. Charles Seminary. Describing a great artist may be a mundane task for many. Understanding a great artist is a joy afforded only a few. Counted among these few are the clergy of St. Charles Seminary, for while many shunned Aikens during his lifetime, their openness and hospitality is not only a tribute to Aikens, but to the seminary itself. I'm Father Joe Glass with this moment in history. Television, since its birth in the early 1950s, has grown to become a common part of people's lives. But it wasn't always the case. Before television, there was radio, and it was radio that served as the window to the world. Woody Allen takes us back to these times with his newest comedy, Radio Days. And here's Mike Gallagher with his review of Allen's latest effort. Hello, I'm Mike Gallagher. How funny is Woody Allen? Funny enough, but not as funny, I think, as certain East Coast critics would have us believe and are much less inclined to credit the profundity that these same pundits profess to see in him. Despite his solemn interiors of a few years back, and despite his recent hand on her sisters, I think that Allen's is far from being an American Ingmar Bergman as he is from being an American Aristophanes. Radio Days, Allen's most recent picture, is a good example of why I like him, but why I also have reservations about him. Radio Days is a nostalgic look at growing up during the war years when everybody listened to the radio. It's setting his rockaway, an oceanfront neighborhood on the outer fringes of New York City. The picture has no real plot, but is rather a collection of vignettes. Most of these are seen through the eyes of Joe, a preteen Jewish boy whose family lives with an abundance of relatives in a big old frame house, one weathered by the winds that blow in from the Atlantic just a block or two away. The radio is a link between the humble denizens of Rockaway and the glamorous stars of Manhattan Cafe Society. As frightfully sophisticated Irene and Roger, for example, whose breakfast show Joe's mother always lends an eager ear to as she cleans up after her own family's considerably more mundane breakfasts. Radio Days is consistently entertaining. It also has a surprising amount of warmth. 
Alan's mood here is much mellower. Joe's parents and his uncles and aunts have their idiosyncrasies, but his view of them is always affectionate, with none of that harsh ridicule of previous films. Radio Days, nonetheless, is not only very slight, it's also flawed by Alan's weakness as a humorist and as an observer of life. He has no flair whatsoever for physical comedy. But a more significant weakness is Alan's inability to make a serious point with his jokes. To get something across, Alan has to stop being funny and turn solemn. And when he turns solemn, he turns banal. This is all too evident in New Year's Eve celebration at the close of radio days. Then his glamorous radio stars begin to make wistful remarks about how swift the passage of time and how fleeting fame. Now maybe that's the kind of thing that makes New York critics think about Chekhov, but not me. I'm Mike Gallagher for Arts Review. Wait a minute. Are you telling me you think the Atlantic is a greater ocean than the Pacific? No, have it your way. The Pacific is greater. Thanks, Mike. Like radio and television, music is a powerful force. We're about to meet a group of young men who have a special way of proclaiming the gospel. Their name is Crossroads. Starting out as a campus ministry group, they quickly developed into a widespread musical apostolate. Now I'd like to present Crossroads, performing their original rendition of I Am The Way. I am the way, the truth and the light. Into the darkness I come with the light. The truth of my gospel, the way of my word. The light of my life gives life to the world. I am the light. Everyone has some special talent, and it's great to see these fellas use theirs. Don't go away. We'll be right back. A few weeks ago, we at Real to Real began an appeal for your financial support. Many of you responded generously, and we wholeheartedly thank you. Because of that, we're able to continue to bring you our show every week. However, we still need and appreciate your continued support. As you know, for the past five seasons, we've been able to bring you this weekly show, requesting only your cards and letters in return. If you're a new viewer, or if you've enjoyed the message of Real to Real over these past years, we'd like to thank you for watching and invite you to participate in this venture by actively supporting the show. Today, with costs rising all around us, we need your financial support. A donation of five, ten, twenty dollars, or whatever you can send would help ensure the continued presence of this program. Send your contributions to Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, PA 19103, and thank you for your help.
Many people find retirement isn't as much fun as they thought it would be. Too much time on their hands, too little to do. The Retired Senior Volunteer Program has thousands of opportunities for retired executives, housewives, engineers, teachers, whatever your skills or schedule. RSVP has something to fit anyone's interests. You can do what you want, when you want to do it, and still enjoy your well-earned retirement. What's your problem? No, no, this no, no, yes. Just figure this out. You've learned a lot in your life. You share the experience of a lifetime. In tonight's program, we learned how Ray Threadgill continues to live a full and active life, despite the fact that he is a paraplegic. Now we'll meet another man who, like Ray, has ignored what many may consider a disability. Neil Lambert lost his vision before the age of 20 as the result of a degenerative eye disease. Interested from a young age in serving God as a religious, Lambert applied to various religious communities. But because of his blindness, he was denied admission. He took on a position tutoring other blind people, which led to some interesting developments in his life. And then Neil Lambert attempted once again to fulfill his desire to enter the priesthood. His persistence paid off, and Lambert was accepted into the St. Charles Seminary in Overbrook. In 1983, he was ordained a priest for the Camden Diocese. Father Lambert is stationed at St. Agnes Parish in Blackwood, New Jersey, where he takes on nearly all the same responsibilities as other parish priests. I know when I came here, there was probably a great deal of apprehension on the part of, you know, all of them when they heard you know, that a blind priest was, had been assigned here. But it really was an educational process. People wanted to do a lot for me. Uh, they'd never been exposed to a blind person, never mind a blind priest before. So I felt that, you know, the job that I had to do was to, you know, disarm them and let them realize that, you know, aside from the fact that I am blind, you know, it, it's not contagious and it doesn't rub off and that basically you know I'm a human being with my good points and my gifts and my limitations and my weaknesses uh, you know I'm one of them I'm a, I'm a man 57 who doesn't happen to see confidence in himself and belief in the guiding hand of God these are two things that have helped father Neil Lambert of st. Agnes Parish in Blackwood New Jersey make his way through a challenging life Born in Brooklyn, New York, Neil Lambert was diagnosed at age 10 as having retinitis pigmentosa, a degenerative eye disease. By age 19, his vision had diminished to the point of legal blindness. It was in his teens that he first felt the calling from God. However, God had different plans. All during his time, as I said, I never had any desire to be a priest, but I always wanted to be a, a, either a teaching brother or a lay brother. And over the next four or five years, I, I actually did apply to six or eight different religious communities for men, uh, namely the, you know, the Mary Knowles, the Graymore Friars, the OFM Franciscans, almost if you name the community, I, I applied for it, including the, the Trappist monks. Because of his blindness, he was not accepted. And during my 20s, when after having been rejected by these communities, and you know, with the thought of impending blindness, I certainly was not the nicest person in the world. I denied my blindness, I fought it, I literally I cursed it. I said I became frustrated by it. So for a period of six, seven, eight years, uh, you know, as I said, it was a difficult time for me. Through the, the grace that God gave me, I was able to get up and go on with my life and pursue my education and obtain a bachelor's degree and eventually a master's degree and found employment for 17 years you know, with the state of New Jersey, which I enjoyed tremendously. And Employed by the commission to help visually impaired people adjust, Neil Lambert met and counseled a young college student who lost her sight as a result of diabetes. She would later become his wife. I was a very fortunate man to have Nancy fall in love with me and decide that she wanted to marry me and spend her life with me, but she was a, a very warm, giving, charitable, compassionate person. She always thought of the other person. She was always willing to share. She worked with, uh, as a volunteer at a nursing home when we moved down here to South Jersey. I certainly was blessed and benefited from the, the three years and 10 months of our marriage. Diabetes took the life of Nancy Lambert in 1972. 
After her death, Neil was encouraged by a priest friend to give religious life one more try. In 1977, he was granted a special dispensation by Rome to attend St. Charles Seminary in Overbrook, Pennsylvania, and in 1983, became a priest of the Diocese of Camden. As a priest, Father Lambert takes on the same responsibilities as other parish priests, with only a few special considerations. When I go about doing parish activities, obviously I need the help of people, I need uh, mobility. So there are several people here in St. Agnes who have been more than willing to help me. And one in particular, Mr. George McNiff, has been with me for the three years that I've been here, and whenever I need help to go to a hospital or visit someone, you know, convalescing from surgery, uh, George or one of the other people of the parish are here. And as far as the readings, I have friends of mine who do the daily readings on tape for me at the appropriate times during the Mass. You know, I, I have my trusty little black box, the tape recorder, and the earplug, and as I said, I just put that in and press the button, and I, you know, recite the readings as I hear them in my ear. Bishop Guilfoyle has seen fit to assign a permanent deacon to me who assists me uh, on each of my Sunday Mass assignments. But God has been good to me. I mean, he showered me with graces. I, I even during the time when things were rough in my 20s, I, I still stayed close to him. I never left the church. I participated in the, you know, the sacramental life of the, of the church. And as I said, it was a difficult time. I fought it, as I said, but I, I hung in there, and, and God saw me through all the hard times and certainly has, has blessed me in, in so many ways that I can never give him adequate thanks. Father Lambert is living proof that blindness need not be a block to service in the church. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, you can contact us by writing to Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. That's Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or call us during business hours at area code 215-668-9842. That's area code 215-668-9842. Next week, continue your spiritual journey with the ever-popular Father Tom Legere, coming to you from Villanova University. Father will discuss 12 steps to improving your spirituality. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll be looking for you again very soon. Good night. Good night, and continue through Lent, mindful that Jesus is Lord. Travel arrangements for Reel to Reel by Atkinson and Mullen Travel of Media PA. Phone area 215-565-7070. House of Charity can be found at work throughout South Jersey, wherever there is suffering and distress. Through its agencies, compassionate care goes to the elderly. The needy receive food and clothing. Special education programs administer to the mentally handicapped. Expectant mothers receive pre- and postnatal care, and medical services are rendered to the ill. Support the House of Charity in South Jersey. Touch someone's life with love. Are you doing anything special next Sunday? Join us. It might become a very special date for you. Next Sunday, we'll gather at St. Bridges for the charismatic prayer meeting and mass at 2 p.m. We're right off Kelly Drive. Don't worry if you're totally new at charismatic renewal. We have talks, tapes, and books to help you catch on right away. That's next Sunday, 2 p.m. at St. Bridges. For directions, call me now, 215-668-HOPE.